name is Paul Hellyer, and I am a former Minister of National Defence for Canada. This disturbing message is for the several million Americans and others who are kind enough to listen to the 22-minute presentation at the Citizens' Disclosure Hearing in Washington in May 2013, and for anyone else who cares deeply about the future of their country and the planet Earth. The U.S. is in grave danger. Strangely, the peril is not from foreign enemies, but from enemies within. So I beg you to listen to a summary of the major problems, followed by some suggestions as to how the U.S. might be recaptured by loyal Americans to the enormous relief of friends who have been watching helplessly from the sidelines. The stakes couldn't be higher. So I spent the 15 months following the Washington hearing feverishly writing a new book, incorporating what I think every American has the right to know and must know to end the incredible naivety observed at the citizens' hearing. The name of the book is The Money Mafia, A World in Crisis. Most of my friends, both American and Canadian, tend to agree that the world is in a state of crisis. But very few are aware that the problems are not natural phenomena. They have been engineered by a very tiny elite group of rich, ruthless and power-hungry people who have been deliberately keeping the majority of decent, hard-working taxpayers totally in the dark. In my brief address to the Citizens' Disclosure Hearing, I said that the United States and much of the Western world is ultimately controlled by an unelected, unaccountable cabal. Its apex is the banking and financial cartel, followed by the oil cartel, the CEOs of the largest and most powerful transnational corporations, major intelligence agencies, including the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA, and a major slice of the U.S. military. Their collective power and influence is incalculable. And it is their plan for the U.S. and the rest of us that is so alarming. Their plan is an empire greater in size and power than any empire before it. They call this the New World Order which, ironically, is the same name Hitler used for the smaller empire he imagined. One sure thing, the New World Order will end all pretense of government of, by, and for the people. It will be a dictatorship of, by, and for a small minority of the rich and privileged elite. Much of its power lies in the privately owned banking system. Why monarchs and politicians allowed a private cartel to become the monopoly supplier of new money, we will never know. But this power is almost absolute and can determine the fate of nations and their people. President Eisenhower was so distressed by the situation that he included in his farewell address to the nation that his fellow Americans should beware of the military-industrial complex. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Otherwise known as the financial, intelligence, and military wing of the all-pervasive cabal which has seized control of the United States and much of the balance of the world. The military-industrial complex adopted a strategy of perpetual warfare to enhance its own power and profit. It is inconceivable that this plan was discussed and approved in advance by any American president. 
Werner von Braun, the German rocket scientist who came to the U.S. at the end of World War II, told my friend Dr. Carol Rosen, who worked with him, that they, the military-industrial complex, in order to maintain perpetual war, had to have an enemy. First, it will be the communists, he said. Then it will be the terrorists. And finally, it will be the ETs. So far, the plan has been unfolding exactly as forecast. The cabal, sometimes referred to as the shadow government, has been in control. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted 
vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short. With a wartime discipline, no democracy would ever hope or wish to match. When Sarah McClendon, veteran White House reporter, asked President Bill Clinton why he didn't do something about UFO disclosure, Clinton replied, and I quote, Sarah, there's a government inside the government, and I don't control it, end of quote. Imagine the President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces isn't cleared to know what his troops are doing. Well, with the end of the Cold War, the Pentagon wrote a new defense plan popularly known as a project for the new American century. It was very far-reaching and involved conquest of much of the world by financial or military means, whichever was easiest. The document, which very few people were aware of, admitted that it was so far-reaching that it might be too much for Americans to swallow in the absence of some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Well, Lady Luck appeared to be on their side in the form of September the 11th, 2001. Amateur foreign pilots trained in the U.S. allegedly hijacked planes and flew them into the sides of the World Trade Towers 1 and 2, and then into the Pentagon. Later in the day, the buildings collapsed. President Bush declared war on the terrorists and invoked the provisions in the North Atlantic Treaty under which an attack on any one country is considered to be an attack on all. The reaction was unprecedented since the outbreak of World War II and the later attack on Pearl Harbor. The English-speaking world in particular was incensed and a high percentage of Americans were prepared to nuke the perpetrators. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld soon announced that, quote, that means war against Iraq, end of quote, even though there was absolutely no evidence of Iraqi complicity, none whatsoever. Although most Muslims have been sympathetic to the U.S. in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, as soon as the bombs started dropping on Baghdad, moderate Muslims by the thousand were so outraged and overcome by hate that they opted for a terrorist response. From that day on, it would be difficult to find a terrorist who did not have made in the USA etched on his or her soul. Now, more than a decade later, the situation becomes even darker as the truth about 9-11 begins to emerge from the burial ground of a controlled press. We find that high officials in the George W. Bush administration knew of the attack weeks in advance and made no effort to prevent it. On the contrary, the evidence points to complicity when we find that not just two nor three buildings collapsed, nor four, nor five, nor six, but seven. Some, if not all, have been rigged for controlled demolition. But that isn't all. A new weapon of mass destruction was used that reduced the concrete and steel to dust before it reached the ground. If you have any doubts about this, get a copy of Dr. Judy Wood's book entitled, Where Did the Towers Go?
500 pages of meticulous evidence. The unfolding story reveals the greatest mass deception in history with the most universally negative consequences. Far more important than the long lineups for security checks at airports, we have been stripped of our civil rights one by one, including, I regret to say, habeas corpus, reversing 800 years of progress. Country was set against country, religion against religion, words like peace and negotiated settlement, which have been possibilities before 9-11, were lost in the jungle of lies. The cabal, also known as the military-industrial complex, was not interested in a just settlement. It wanted perpetual war, and that was what its heinous deception achieved. It also robbed the once great United States of America of its last vestige of moral leadership. Worse, by invoking NATO, it transformed a defense alliance into a U.S.-led task force. And by recruiting former countries from the Soviet Union, an obvious provocation to Russia, it has managed to create rumblings of a new Cold War. The danger lies in the fact that the New World Order is not limited to old boundaries and concepts of empire, and we seem hell-bent toward a third world war, horrible beyond human imagination. It must not be allowed to happen. Almost every president since Eisenhower has been under the control of the cabal, and President Obama regrettably has been no exception. Before he was sworn in as a new president, I saw a picture of his economic advisors, and I said, oh, oh, the same old gang who permitted the Bush recession. Nothing will change. Then when the president persuaded innocent allies to join in a second unwinnable war in Iraq, and a senior U.S. military commander confirmed that it would take several years to win, it was obvious that President Obama was playing the military-industrial alliance game, and that it would be the only winner. I get hundreds of emails from decent Americans and like-minded individuals in a dozen countries who want nothing more than the end of militarism and a massive shift in priorities toward universal peace and justice. Quite a few are involved in small projects that are making a significant difference at the micro level. But most of them are realists and recognize that the cabal doesn't want peace and justice. It wants power, wealth, and empire. So what can an individual do in the face of unprecedented power and wealth? The cabal, headed by the banking cartel, has almost unlimited financial power. But we, the people, have the numbers and must combine our limited power to form a critical mass that can move mountains. The U.S. should play a leadership role in ending the private banker's monopoly to print money. Actually, it isn't really money, it's just credit created out of thin air, uh, a computer entry, and restore some of the power to the people that is rightfully theirs. There cannot and will not be peace and justice on earth while the Fed continues to exist. There must be full disclosure of what the cabal and the U.S. shadow government have been doing since World War II. To hear the truth emerge after so many years of continual lies and darkness will require either that the National Security Act of 1947 be rescinded or suspended, with a general amnesty so that decent Americans can tell the truth without fear of retribution a kind of truth and reconciliation process will be required. Then there are the positive benefits that must be pursued. The president must issue an order that would release the secret patents on exotic energy 
and make them available to the world. The secret technology, in combination with the flexible financial system, will make it possible to convert from an oil economy to a clean economy in seven years. It will provide billions of new jobs worldwide and help close the ever-widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. Simultaneously, a project should be started to restore our oceans before the food chain has been permanently broken. In addition, worldwide programs of forest uh, preservation and reforestation should help provide the carbon sinks essential for greater stability in weather patterns. Speaking of changing weather patterns, full disclosure should give us a better idea of how much weather patterns have been altered by government tinkering. Due to restraints of time, space, and expertise, my book makes no mention of either chemtrails or the high frequency active auroral research program known as HARP. But from what I have heard and read from credible informants, I would say that they are Satan's illegitimate Siamese twins of death and destruction. If so, they should be terminated at once and relegated to the netherworld from which they came. And before the people of the world become aware and launch a 10 or 20 trillion dollar class action suit against the United States Air Force, its contractors, associates, and suppliers. A visit to the battlefields of World Wars I and II in November of last year affected me profoundly. The slogans were everywhere, never again. We had seen the horror of man's inhumanity to man which was sorted beyond belief. Yet as I reflected on the real world of today, I thought that the millions who gave their lives had died in vain. Even before the Second World War was over, a group of greedy, self-centered men were plotting the next round, and they had been working assiduously at their plan. The same symptoms of mass unemployment Poverty and seeking military advantage have been replicated. But the next time, we would start off with weapons of mass destruction just in their infancy then. The next time, it is not just supremacy that is at stake, although there are some who think so. It is the survival of the human species that is at stake. God will not be mocked. We have been given the choice of making our planet uninhabitable, as we have been told some other species have done. Or we can move in the opposite direction of peace, love, justice, and cooperation for the betterment of all rich and poor alike. We have been given a few months, not years, to change course before it is too late. The choice is ours. We are the ones who are destined to write our own history. Almost every nation has invested enormous amount of money in building and stockpiling arms, armaments, bombs, missiles. So all of us as people, were we all thinking all these bombs are being kept for entertainment, for display or it's artwork? What did you think? One day it will be used. The question is on whom? Wars are almost inevitable because the economies are built on war. So we have no intent of stopping the war. Let's be clear about that. When it happens to us, we will cry. When it's happening somewhere else, it's drama. This inhuman attitude towards war 
and to killing and the suffering that other people go through, we must come out of that. Because most evil things have happened, not necessarily because of evil intentions, simply apathy. You sleep through life, that is what is happening to the world, both in terms of soil and in terms of war. We sleep through. After World War II, we formed League of Nations, we made United Nations. The idea was never again such wars will happen, right? Since then, how many wars? Actually, if you look at it, there's not been a single day's break on this planet after World War II without at least a battle going on somewhere. We are not saying we are not in such a la-la land that we don't have any issues. We have issues. But this is the idea of setting up a platform which would solve problems. <laughs> we have pushed it to the side and doing what we want. So how do we wake up? First thing is, within your hearts, your anger and hatred must go. I must tell you this. А вы в свою очередь вешаете своему населению. И люди не чувствуют опасности. Вот меня что беспокоит. Ну как вот как мы не можем понять? Мы мы тащим мир вообще в в совершенно новое измерение. Вот в чём проблема. Делают вид, что как будто ничего не происходит. Но я не знаю даже как достучаться. Ну и вот and I say this our country is in trouble. Something has to happen, and if it doesn't happen, and if we don't have smart leadership, you're going to end up with no world. The world is going to be blown to pieces. We have stupid people now running our country. The world is going to be blown to pieces. What are you thinking about? If the nuclear bomb were to explode right now, what would you choose? Live or die? Live? Yeah, because if I died, then there would be a lot of things I couldn't do anymore. I'll never see my family again. I'll miss the sun on my face. I'll never eat my favourite food again. Never travel. Never be in love. I wouldn't live what about you what would you choose live or die die because if i survived i wouldn't be able to do a lot of things anymore oh. i'd never see my family again i'd miss the sun on my face i'd never taste my favorite food again Never travel. <laughs> Never be in love. I wouldn't live. The United Nations was founded so that we would never forget the crimes of great power. Are we now in danger of forgetting? Do we forget the lies that justified the conquest of Iraq and disguised America's plans to dominate all the world? And do we accept a distortion of intellect and morality that empties noble words like democracy and liberation of their true meaning? that says it's wrong for a terrorist to kill innocent people, but right for governments to commit the same crimes in our name. The answer is that we need not accept any of this if we recognize that there are now two superpowers. One is the regime in Washington, the other is public opinion, now stirring all over the world, perhaps as never before. Make no mistake, it's an epic struggle. The alternative is not just the conquest of faraway countries, it's the conquest of us, of our minds, our humanity and our self-respect. If we remain silent, victory over us is assured. Don't buy into the shadow's dream. Wake up, recreate yourself anew. You are the one you have been waiting for. Are you ready to win?